to welcome everyone, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you all for joining our session today, knowing when, where, and how to reapply. I'll be this session's moderator. My name is Charlene Green, and I'm Assistant Dean of Admissions, Outreach, and Diversity at UC Davis School of Medicine. Today, you'll be hearing from a successful reapplicant, um, an advisor. Hopefully, our advisor had some con conflicts today, but hopefully, she'll be able to join, and an admissions representative who will share their tips for reapplying to medical school. As a reminder, we'll take questions at the end of the session, so feel free to post your questions in the Q&A. Also, this session will be recorded for those who cannot listen live. <clears throat> okay, today with us we have Dr. Pasquale Manzera, Assistant Dean um, of Medical Student Affairs at Sanford School of Medicine, University of South Dakota. Hopefully we'll have Dr. Aaron Miskowski, Executive Director of Career Services from Florida Southern College, and Darren Ching, a first year medical student, uh, Washington State University, Elson S. Floyd College of Medicine. So first we're gonna get started and go ahead and hear from Dr. Manzera. Yes, thank you. So I've been uh, Assistant Dean of Student Affairs and Admissions for about eight years. And for about eight years, I've been providing feedback to applicants that did not receive an offer from us. In fact, I've now in about two weeks of meeting with applicants and, and uh, providing feedback for them. So next slide, please. Um, you can see I, I love art. I was inspired a couple of weeks ago when I was in uh, New York. I went to the MoMA, and and so that inspired me actually to form my talk. And so, my first piece of advice is pick up the pieces. So I don't know if cubism counts as picking up the pieces. I know it's very disappointing. All of you have worked very hard to get to this stage, um, but it's very important that you roll up your sleeves, dust yourself off, get up, and get back into the game. Um, you know, not just to call it a game. Resiliency is a, is a key part of this. You know, I think the AAMC has their pre-med core um, competencies. Most schools are using those as the attributes they're looking for. So, uh, you know, when I give my talk, I'm going to talk about big picture items. And so resiliency is the first sign of, of an excellent future applicant. Uh, and part of that is the motivation. It, if this is really what you want to do, then do it, right? If this is really what you, you're calling. And then the next thing I'll, I'll point out there that's important is professionalism. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of be stay disappointed. It's easy maybe to be a little bit hurt or angry, uh, but it's important that uh, you deflect that, you know, get into more positive uh, a mode of thinking, um, you know, make sure that you're, um, you know, don't blame others. Don't blame the college professor that might've given you a C in a course. Don't blame admissions committees that they made a mistake. Don't blame advisors or other people that may have given you advice. I think what's important now is to have that growth mindset, right? I've gotten a setback. How am I going to move forward from this? So, and in terms of motivation, that's really the next slide, if I, I can get that. Uh, and that's reflection. So here we have a, a girl before a mirror. I, I tell all my applicants, you know, Look in the mirror, be honest, be self-aware. So this is more about EQ, emotional intelligence, than IQ at this point, right? So before I meet with applicants, I hope that they now are doing some self-directed learning. That's another buzzword that all medical schools are looking for in their students. Independent, the ability to kind of identify uh, opportunities, uh, learning objectives. So we call them learning objectives, develop your own learning objectives, um, so first thing, be honest, be self-aware. I, When I meet with students, the first thing I ask them is, now that you have time to reflect, talk to me about some of the strengths and, uh, that you had in your applications and things that, that, you, that you feel you've done well. And then I, I make sure to tell them, make sure their strengths, because it's easy to start looking at things that you're missing, focus on that, and then strengths end up becoming weaknesses, right? And then that's the other part is, you know, identify opportunities. You know, what is it that uh, I I might be missing? Uh, how am I gonna you know make up for that? Uh, you know, uh, make up for that gap or or that missing piece. Uh, so develop those learning objectives or identify what's missing. Come up with at least a plan, and then I you know typically all students like confirmation of their plan. And so if we get to the next part is the teamwork part, right? So regroup. Um, so here's a good time to hopefully if you've had a number of interviews at different schools, contact those schools to see if you can get some feedback. So 
in the letters that we send out to students that uh, we did not make an offer to, we specifically say, if you're interested in getting feedback, uh, contact us and we'll set up a time. So I meet half hour with every applicant that is interested. I'll go over their application and, and, and talk about things kind of general and then some specifics in some areas. So that is a great resource. And here's where I'll talk about professionalism, right? Make sure you're ready. Make sure you've done your homework, your learning objectives, be prepared. Uh, make sure that if you were a little bit angry to not be angry. So I, just to give you a quick story, I, I met with an applicant several years ago. You can, you know, I sensed they were a little bit tense uh, through it. I went through their application, you know, their application and thought some things that they can, you know, uh, improve on. And basically they looked at me and said, so much that you guys know, I have two other offers and clearly you made a mistake, right? And at that point, I think that applicant probably got off the phone and said, I showed them. I got off the phone and I say, wow, we dodged a bullet, right? I mean, you know, that's a little bit maybe petty. I mean, admissions is not a perfect science, but we all have our different, you know, goals and mission that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so don't be that person, because uh, when you meet with individuals in the admissions office, even when you're calling administrative assistants, talking to them, you have to be always on your best behavior because people take notes. OK, so make sure that you're in a good frame of mind, positive frame of mind. That growth mindset is key. All right. Pre-med advisor, uh, if you have the opportunity, you're still maybe in your, your senior year when you applied take full advantage of that. If you're a non-trad student, that gets a little bit harder. But I think if you call back to the schools that you graduated from, I'm sure hopefully you've built some relationship with the pre-med advisor that they're willing to probably help you and, and talk a bit more. So pre-med advisor uh, is a, a key point to all this. Family and friends. Uh, so when I talk about family and friends, sure, you may have a, a parent or uncle or family member that's in med school or maybe a friend. Um, Many of you don't. So what I'm really referring to here is, as you identify your learning objectives, there's probably a number of things that you have to do. And that's gonna require uh, probably some sacrifices, uh, resource help. So those of you that maybe are married with children, this is about talking to your, your significant other, your spouse. These are some of the things I need to do. Can we work together to make this, this happen, right? If you need to do a master's program, well, now you might have to you know, quit work full time doing a program and come up with money. So part of this is also working with your team, your family members. Can you provide support? If you're just graduating, perhaps you're still living at home. Are your parents willing to still you know, provide you room and board while you maybe do a master's program or, or things like that? So that's part of the, the discussion. And then AM, double AMC is a great resource. I, I'm surprised that sometimes a number of applicants I meet with that have not fully utilized the WMC services, the, the pre-med advisor services. Some of them didn't even look on the WMC MSAR site, so the medical uh, school uh, admissions requirement site to make sure that they're applying to the right schools or they have a chance for those schools or the mission of those schools. So, and, and events such as this are just key, I think very important into, into helping with that. So next slide. So the other thing I want to just talk about briefly is, is mission fit. So our school is, a, it, we're, a, we're the only medical school in our state. We're a big state, small population, a lot of rural areas. So our mission, if you can uh, bring up to the next, um, I think, slide part. I mean, it's really emphasis on family medicine. We need primary care, working in and living in underserved areas. Now we are the only medical school, so we still need orthopedic surgeons. So we're playing this line of, you know, still need specialists, but our focus is is primary care, uh, rural setting, and we mean it. So if you go to the next part of that, you know, we finished 99th percent off of graduates practicing in a rural area, and then the next line in terms of, you know, providing experiences for our students in, clin in, in free clinics and underserved populations, we have that throughout our state. You know, our we rely on our community to help train our medical students. Our community relies on us to hopefully graduate physicians that practice in their communities. So that's a very important part of us. And I think we still get app applicants that don't necessarily realize that, you know, and, and so that's a key important part uh, of that uh, process. And so go to the MSAR, look at the mission statements, 
you know, talk to, uh, hopefully if you know people that go to that school or talk to the actual directors, um, just to make sure that you're aligning yourself. It, it costs a lot of money to apply to these schools. So be focused with that. Next slide. Yeah, and if I can just reiterate one key tip is demonstrate that growth mindset. You've, you've, you've gotten the setback. What's important here is how you respond to that setback, right? And, and that's about learning about the different things that um, about yourself, what might be missing that you can improve on. Because at our school, we've, we've had applicants get in after their fourth try. Um, what we're looking for is growth. We're looking for is where are you now? What we're looking for, are you continually trying to improve yourself? We don't care how many times you apply, we're looking for that growth. And, and for some individuals, it just takes a little longer to maybe mature or takes a little longer to get a full understanding that this is actually what they really want to do, or at least articulate that to us. Uh, so remember the growth mindset and uh, stay positive and, and it'll be a mission accomplished. So uh, I try to keep it brief because I think it's more important to get to the questions and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very insightful um, start to our talk today. Um, next, we will hear from Dr. Miskowski. All right, thank you so much. And, uh, and, and thank you to the WMC and the fellow panelists and for everyone listening today. It's, it's a complete honor uh, to be asked to be a presenter on this panel. Um, so a little bit about my background. I'm currently the Executive Director of uh, Career Services at Florida Southern College. Um, very recently, as of less than a month ago, I was the Director of uh, Pre-Health Advising at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida. Um, and at the University of Central Florida, we have a very large pre-med population, um, about 500 applicants a year. And I've worked with, um, over the 13 years I was in uh, this position at, at that university, probably hundreds to thousands of pre-med students. And many of them um, did apply to medical school first time around. And, and for a variety of reasons, it, it didn't work out the first time. Um, and in our office, I uh, had a pretty big team of advisors there. We got very good and, and had a system for how do we as pre-health advisors work with our students that have to reapply. On the front end, of course, we're going to do our best to, um, at least the ones that reach out to us, to try to help you know if your application is going to be competitive. Um, and, and, you know, med school is so competitive nowadays. We have applicants, we think, yes, you will be competitive, but they just don't get in, right? It, it just happens sometimes. Um, and, and then sometimes we have applicants that maybe weren't that competitive in the first place, but applied anyway. You know, so we, we really see all kinds. Um, and, and what we like to do is we kind of call it a two-step process. Our first step um, is that we're gonna sit with our students and dissect those applications. Um, and I'll talk about that on this slide in a second. And the second step is once we dissect the application, um, we're going to make a plan and a timeline, okay? So it's almost like um, as you all as future physicians, you're going to diagnose, right, first, and then you're going to create a plan with that patient. As pre-health advisors, we kind of do the same thing if you all as pre-meds were our patients. Um, so in the dissect phase, now keeping in mind, this would be an applicant that has already applied. So as a pre-health advisor, we're going to see or we're going to ask them to send us that AMCAS or a comus if you're an osteopathic applicant. And there's a few things that are almost low hanging fruit for us to look at. Of course, the metrics, those are pretty easy. GPA and MCAT, are they even competitive? You know, sometimes we'd see an applicant that would apply to an MD school with a, a 2.8, you know. Um, of course, holistic review, that doesn't mean that that's completely not competitive, but that is something for us to take a look at. Um, and, and I'll talk about in, the, in our next slide, which I'm not going to go to yet, about kind of a plan and a timeline for that. Similarly, if the MCAT is very low, you know, that's kind of a low hanging fruit to say, hey, you know, let's let's kind of create a plan for how to increase that. Easier said than done. I'm very aware. Um, timing of the application in secondary is another low hanging fruit. Some of our applicants applied really late in the process. Um, maybe they were putting their pieces of the application together, or maybe they just didn't know that we were so they were supposed to apply kind of early. Um, we usually recommend to try your best to apply in June, at least with the primary application, the AMCAS, 
if you can. And then very closely after that, those secondary applications, those are the, the ones that, that kind of linger a little bit. Um, med schools will not really uh, look at your application oftentimes unless the secondary is submitted as well. So we don't want you to linger on that secondary. A really important section that we as pre-health advisors look at is the experiences section. Um, the, the experiences section is really a section of the application where you can really make your application really pop off the page or not pop. So things that we're looking at are depth and breadth of each of your activities. So by, by depth, um, we mean, is it a large number of hours, right? And breadth is for, was it for a large number of months? Okay, so ideally, a lot of your 15 activities for AMCAS will have depth in large number of hours and breadth, large number of months, but you're human. Not every activity can have that. There's only so many hours in the day, but we are gonna look at depth and breadth of each activity. We're gonna look at the experience descriptions. You don't get a lot of space to write about what you've done. So you gotta really take advantage and make it a high quality description. Does it include a reflection of what you've done? Um, real quick story, because I know we have other panelists. I had an applicant this cycle um, worked with her in December. I had not seen her before she applied. Um, she had a 4.0 GPA and a 520 MCAT. Applied last summer during the cycle. By December, she had no interviews and was like, what's going on? We looked at her AMCAS. Her experience descriptions were written very matter-of-factly. It was just content. This is what I did. She didn't use up close to the whole box. It was um, at least it was sentence style, not resume style, but that was definitely something that stood out. So, I mean, really, it's it's everything in the AMCAS has to be really well done and really thought through. Um, and the last thing with the experience descriptions is uh, any any holes in the types of the experiences. You know, med schools want to see a variety of experiences, those community service and volunteerism health related, community service volunteerism non-health related, shadowing, leadership, research. We call those our big five. We want, we want to touch on at least those big five in the 15 AMCAS activities. If we see some of those have not been touched on, we might call that a, a hole. And then we kind of are going to create a plan for how to go forward. So personal statement, school list, interview skills, we will help you dissect all of those as well. So that's the dissection phase. So let's go to our step two. Um, so the next one is, like I said, the plan and the timeline. So once we dissect it and we know here's some areas to increase, we're not just going to let you out the door. We say, let's talk about that. How do you want to do it? What is the best fit for you? And what is the best timeline? Um, so if it's the metrics, such as the GPA or the MCAT that have to get enhanced, you know, we're going to talk about different ways to get the GPA up, knowing that this is not usually a quick fix. This might take a little bit of time, right? Um, so maybe it's a post back program, maybe it's doing more undergrad classes um, at a different institution, maybe it's doing a master's program somewhere else, but we're going to talk about options and what's the best fit. Uh, for an MCAT, that kind of can be a quick fix <laughs> um, in that you can just kind of take the test and get the score higher, but it often takes a lot of time to re-prepare for that test. So we never want you to just go, oh, I'll just go take it again in August. Uh, -uh. Let's really sit and, and evaluate what's the best plan. How do you learn best? Because if you did it the first time, it didn't work. We want to change that. With your experiences, we're going to look at where are the holes uh, we want to make a plan for how to enhance the depth and breadth. So really looking at are there activities to add? Are there areas to enhance? Um, and then just other areas of the application. Um, applying earlier, if, if it's as simple as that. Um, maybe working with the personal statement. Um, real quick story on that. I had an applicant uh, years ago, very high GPA, very high MCAT again. Um, decent activities and had applied twice before he came to see his pre-health advisor um, and was like, what's, what's wrong with my application? In his personal statement, his very first sentence, he used the word idid, I-T apostrophe D. Now, if you're thinking that's not a word, that's what we said, idid is not a word. So it really is just showing that, that you know maybe it's a little bit of judgment, maybe he didn't have someone review it, 
Um, but we got them fixed up. <laughs> um, we, we got that word edited out of the personal statement in that first sentence. Um, personal statement was great and he got in that third time. So that was great. So um, the other thing is, I think it was mentioned already, sometimes you know, pre-health advisors will definitely do an application review, uh, but medical schools as well will sometimes do an application review for you as well after you apply to help you know how to enhance and create that timeline for the future. And now our next panelist. Thank you so much. Some incredible gems. So I hope folks were taking notes. Um, as an admissions dean, I can say I'm in 100% agreement with all of that. And I think I would sum the, some of that up with, do not go through this process on your own. Make sure you um, recruit the help that you need to get through this process. So with that, we will hear from our last speaker, our medical student panelist, Darren. Thank you, Dr. Green. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Darren Ching, and I'm a first year medical student at Washington State University. So far, we've discussed insight from a pre-health advisor's perspective, as well as from admissions. This session about helping others who are thinking about reapplying to medical school, it really means a lot to me. Um, I, I applied to medical school five times, and that experience really shaped my desire to support those who are navigating medical school admissions. So today, in the next 10 minutes, I'll be sharing my journey and three overarching lessons that I learned. Next slide, please. The first lesson I would like to share is about reflection, connecting the dots, and sharing your story. So for a moment, let's, let's think about getting ready to reapply using the tips and advice we've discussed so far. So applying early, selecting schools, taking into account mission fit, GPA, MCAT through MSAR, acceptance data, such as if a program primarily matriculates students from a particular state, for example, rec letters, you know, requesting them early, perhaps it's a committee letter or a letter from one of your three most meaningful experiences in AMCAS. It could be a physician letter, letter from research or a community service experience. But something that still sticks with me today is how it's also important to be intentional about asking for a strong letter of recommendation. AMCAS, so you've selected a wide range of experiences, but also made sure to categorize them appropriately. So for example, maybe you have six really great community service experiences, but let's say you really took the lead in organizing two of those. Categorizing those experiences under leadership frames that part of your application in a slightly different way. And finally, as you're working on your experiences section and personal statement, it's, it's so important to ask yourself, have you deeply reflected on your experiences? What did you gain or learn about teamwork, leadership, or yourself? If you arrived at a particular insight, can you take your reflection one level further? Are you using reflective language? Have you connected the dots to illustrate how your experiences built off one another, that the whole is greater than the sum of, the, of its parts, that your experiences influence the physician you hope to become, the goals you strive to achieve, the challenges you hope to address, and the impact you hope to make real. After self-reflection, connect the dots and effectively share your story. I was born and raised in Vancouver, Washington, which is where my family decided to settle down when they came from Cambodia. I attended the University of California, Berkeley, but I quickly realized at the start that I wasn't as prepared as I had hoped. Halfway through college, I was accepted to what is now called the Summer Health Professions Education Program in Seattle. And that was a very special moment for me, not only because it was the first time I had the opportunity to shadow a physician, but because it was the first time that a large community made me feel that there was a place for me in medicine. The beauty of a first time is that it will lead to a thousand other first. So after the summer, I returned to college and I was fortunate to be elected co-president of the UC Berkeley chapter of the American Medical Student Association. And during my senior year, I served as conductor of the TEDx Berkeley Orchestra. And I also continued supporting a team that launched a project called Pre-Meds of Berkeley, which was inspired by Humans of New York, where we interviewed students navigating their medical school uh, journey. However, uh, what I didn't know at that time was how these early experiences would shape future opportunities I had during my gap years. Next slide, please. The second lesson I would like to share is about setbacks, feedback, and resilience. 
in 2017, I applied to medical school. And by the time I ended the application cycle without an acceptance, I felt all different kinds of emotions. And maybe some of you joining us today have had a similar experience of things not going quite exactly how we planned. Learning how to bounce back from setbacks, adopting a growth mindset, these are all important for responding to challenges and adversities in life as a physician and also beyond. I, I highly encourage reapplicants to see if the program they applied to offer any opportunities, like a meeting to receive personalized feedback. Working with a pre-med advisor can help you determine how to improve your application to help you be very, very strategic with your time and efforts. And when you reapply, be prepared to discuss in your application and or interview uh, the, the obstacles that you faced and how you grew as a person. During the interviews, it's it's really important to be yourself, you know, but on the other hand, that doesn't necessarily mean winging it. Uh, familiarize yourself with the school's interview format. You can practice mock interviews with a friend over Zoom. Uh, think about different types of experiences you might like to talk about during your interviews. If you're going through multiple mini interviews and one didn't go as well as you hoped, take a moment, you know, take in a deep breath, reset, ground yourself, ready for the next one. And finally, when you face setbacks, ask yourself, is there anyone else you can talk to, a mentor, a coach, someone who can provide another perspective to provide additional feedback to help you make the most out of your time and energy? making sure that you're also prioritizing your well-being, which is also a part of how you cultivate resilience. After I graduated from college, I decided to pursue post-bac coursework at Washington State University to enhance my academic record. I became a medical scribe, and as luck would have it, the physician I worked with not only attended the same college as me, but was also a reapplicant to medical school. They shared advice and encouraged me to keep going. Uh, the leadership skills I gained in college would eventually lead me to take on advocacy and a range of initiatives at the National Cambodian American Organization. When I joined AmeriCorps, I had the opportunity to channel that same spirit and passion for supporting pre-medical students in college, but now in a new way uh, for high school students. I helped them learn biology and chemistry, but I also shared my journey and, and the lessons I learned in the same exact way that we're sharing this moment together. In the evenings after working at the high school, I volunteered at the local free clinic. And then in the middle of the school year, the COVID-19 pandemic occurred. Things led to another, uh, building off my experience conducting interviews in college uh, while also ensuring proper health protocols. I had the chance to direct a one hour documentary of frontline volunteers who served their community during the pandemic. Next slide, please. And the third lesson I would like to share is about finding your balance in holistic review. Holistic review in medical school admissions is, it's mission driven. It's ideally a, a balance of life experiences, personal attributes and academic metrics. And while the idea that one aspect alone of someone's application should not be the, the primary factor in consideration of applicants, one thing that I share with other pre-medical students is to be cautious of over relying on other aspects of your application to uplift a key area that's perhaps missing or needs much further development. So for example, you know, applying to medical school with a well-rounded application may not be able to compensate for an extremely low GPA or very minimal uh, healthcare exposure. That being said, however, Everyone has their own path to medical school. You know, moments of unexpected detours, moments of pause to reflect, uh, to celebrate, uh, to recuperate, and to prepare for the next stage of their journey. So for me, I decided to pursue grad school, which allowed me to attain my first research publication. And upon graduation, I joined the school as a graduate teaching assistant. And my, my experience serving patients at the free clinic uh, led me to a new opportunity, the chance to join a mobile clinic that travels throughout various areas of Oregon. And then finally, after five cycles, I received a call that offered me a spot in the MD program at Washington State University. Next slide, please. 
I, I really do believe that our journeys shape who we are and the future we aspire to make real. Uh, for me, that means addressing health disparities in Washington and beyond. It means supporting pre-medical students and being an advocate in my community. If you're applying, reapplying to med school, it's just part of your story. It's not the whole story. So keep writing your story. Thank you and best of luck. Wow, thank you so much, um, Darren. Those insights were incredible um, and so authentic. And so thank you for, for sharing every piece of that story that you did. Um, so now we will actually be moving into some questions. So let's take a look at the Q&A and see what questions have come in. All right. Um, so our first question, um, should one prioritize a better MCAT score by a few points over applying um, an earlier over applying an earlier cycle, when should we draw the line? A month after the application opens um, at the latest or the latest time to apply? I can start with that. So what's gonna be important is you really take a look at the different schools that you're applying to because every school is different. So at our school, it doesn't matter when you apply in a cycle and that may be on the rare side because our philosophy is we like to look at every applicant at least once before we fill our class. Other schools are different. They have a rolling admissions that they go in and once they fill their class, you might be only eligible for you know a wait list or some sort. So I really encourage you to check the MSAR uh, site and don't be afraid to call the schools and talk to the directors there and say, hey, you know, uh, this is my situation. Can you let me know a little bit about your program, how you go through the process of selecting whether I need to get my application in early or not? So uh, I, I think you just need to approach each school that way that you're applying to to find that out. And I don't know, pre med, you know, Dr. Miskowski may have uh, a view on that, but we may be in the, in the, rare side of not being important of when you apply during the cycle. Um, just to, to chime in from the pre-health advisor side, um, you know, we kind of have to be always paying attention to all schools <laughs> our applicants could be applying to. Um, what, what I've gathered from a lot of medical school admissions directors is they do like those early applicants. And I believe your question was about, you know, MCAT score a few points higher applying earlier. You know, I, and I say this a lot when I do these virtual workshops with my students, like it, it just really depends on, on your whole application package and, and who you are. It's hard for us to answer those questions without knowing more about you as an individual. So um, obviously, you know, within holistic review, MCAT is a piece of that, but it, it is fortunately slash unfortunately a, a pretty important piece. Um, but but yeah, it's a tough question to answer without knowing, like, are we talking like a 500 to a 503 or a 518 to a 521 or, or you know, those pieces are tough to know. Um, going to move to the next question, but I was going to say I completely agree with that. And I think this is why we say, please recruit some help and support from advisors and people who help people get into medical school or health profession school, because whenever if someone asks me a question about specific metrics or a specific element of the application, my answer is always, it depends. I need to see what the whole package looks like. Because when we say holistic admissions, we really mean holistic admissions. So it's just one element, although a very important element, it is just one element on the application we're looking at to decide if you are ready for medical school rigor, good fit for our mission, all of those things just discussed. Um, so here's a good one. Um, it's fairly common for medical students to apply. Is it fairly common for medical students to apply more than once to get in? Does it make a student look bad to apply more than once? I'll start from admissions. Uh, we care about growth. And so we look at each application every year in, in that light of, of what have they done and how they've grown. Like I said, we've accepted applicants after their fourth, fifth try. We've accepted applicants that stepped out for years and come back. Uh, we have some 30 year olds. We have some 40 year olds that got in, not a lot, but you know, so really it's about, you know, your motivation 
and you know have you grown since your last applicant now that that's us you know I've heard some rumors that some schools may have a cap like three strikes and 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 that's it but I I'm not too aware of too many schools like that but um, anecdotally, I, I would say a lot of the students that I've worked with over the years are reapplicants. Um, exactly what Dr. Manzara said, growth. I mean, sometimes there's a secondary question on the applications that literally says, if you're a reapplicant, what have you done since last time you applied to strengthen your application? Um, so it is a lot about, about that growth. Um, I Speaking for a variety of med schools that we've spoken to, I, I I don't think it's a bad thing because it is so common. Um, the AAMC probably has statistics on it. Um, I feel like I should know them, but I, I don't want to misquote them um, as far as the number of applicants that, that are reapplicants each year. Um, and Darren is living proof here that it works. <laughs> um, the next question um, is actually related to what Dr. Menzera talked about. I'm sorry, Menzera talked about um, how does an applicant best demonstrate growth after disclosing an institutional action? I, I can think of one one quick story, um, and of course, it'll it depends, right? As as we're saying, it depends on what that institutional action is. Uh, but I, I think of my student, Anthony, from a few years ago. Um, he had an institutional action for, um, I don't remember what it was called, but it was cheating in a class. Um, he took another class with that professor. You know, it, it didn't give him a failing grade in the class or anything like that, but it was an institutional action on file with our student conduct. Um, he knew he would have to disclose it when it came time in his medical school application. Um, he took another class with that professor, um, tripled down his efforts, became a TA for the professor, and got a letter of recommendation from him that was outstanding. So, you know, he took a situation that was very difficult for him and, and really, you know, turned lemons into lemonade. And, and that's, that's probably a, a situation that stands out because I think it is, it is kind of tough to um, show growth with something like an institutional action. Um, Dr. Manzara, Darren, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, it's about taking ownership of, we all made mistakes, right? It's about taking ownership. What have you learned from that? What have you done since then? So, you know, we quite often see, you know, maybe having alcohol in a dorm, you know, under it, you know, like that, that's, you know, fairly common. Do you have five or six of those? That's a problem. If it's one and you haven't had any for a while, that's okay. Uh, I mean, it's about taking ownership and how have you learned from that? You know, what not to do? I think one year an applicant was asked a question about, about a, an incident that they had. I, I think there was an open container in a car and basically said, well, you know, if if my friend didn't run the, the stop sign, it wouldn't have got caught, right? And missing a point that he was underage having alcohol so, I mean, you know, I think it's about taking ownership, understanding, you know, I made a mistake. What have I learned from it? Thank you. I agree with Dr. Manzara, too. And I think that once you've done the reflection and you've taken ownership of it, it can also help you if you're presented with like a hypothetical scenario in an interview where something like that has occurred. You can kind of walk through to, to the person who's interviewing you the steps that you think would be appropriate uh, to in, in, in sort of navigating you know, that that sort of could be a question about ethics, you know, a question about what you what you think um, you should be doing to sort of also making sure that something like that doesn't happen in the future. So again, um, I think it's about taking ownership and learning about that experience and demonstrating to that in a very articulate way uh, to, to uh, the programs. Thank you, panelists. So the next question, maybe we'll start with Darren. Um, one of our audience members would like to know any advice on how to address the fact that going through undergrad during the pandemic was it was almost impossible to create rapport via Zoom with professors and get good letters of recommendation. Any advice there? Yeah, I do. Um, I so when I started my master's program, they actually uh, turned it online for that entire duration of of the of the academic um, program. So in that case, I had to really try my best to speak up in, in Zoom. Um, I tried to reach out during office hours. Sometimes they, they do virtual office hours. Any any sort of ways like that to try to build rapport. Um, also try to also finding ways to personalize 
um, yourself to uh, the person you're uh, working with. Uh, I, in my specific case, I decided to uh, join the school. So that also gave me an opportunity to uh, work intimately with, with the faculty. But I think that if, if that's um, not always an option for everyone, but taking the initiative, I would, I would say, to really be proactive about asking for help, uh, asking if there's other ways that you can augment or enhance your learning. These, these are some, I think, really important tips to build further rapport with uh, faculty and sort of the Zoom university that we've uh, transitioned to. I'll add to that a little bit. I, you know, I tell applicants, you know, uh, in that situation, have a good CV resume, uh, contact someone that you think you might want to have write your letter, ask if you could meet, whether it's via Zoom or whatever, and and show yourself, right? So hopefully you can get, get at that half hour meeting or so, and and you can go into more detail about what you've done, and they can might see the enthusiasm and passion. So that gives them a little bit more to hang on as they write that letter of reference. So there are ways that you can, you know, add, add, add to that, you know, without just cold calling them and, and just like a two dimensional resume that if you meet with them and talk to them and maybe explain your motivations that that'll help a lot. Cause they'll use that in the letter of reference. That same, same thing happens, you know, experience like shadowing has been hard to get. And I tell students mm -hmm. it's hard you know, and maybe you don't get as many shadow, sh shadowing hours, but it's about the quality of the hours that you spent and the time that you spent preparing for those, you know, so if you know you're going to do family medicine, shadowing or orthopedic, maybe find out what kind of patients you're going to see. Maybe I'll learn a bit more about that particular issue or read, you know, I think that's the thing over COVID, you know, find out more about the practice of medicine. And uh, there's a ton during COVID. And so you could actually become well read and 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 then be able to articulate, you know, things that normally you would see in a shadowing experience. You know, so you need to kind of combine both worlds and do the best you can. Okay. The next question is directly addressed to Dr. Miskowski. Um, question regarding the writing style that you touched on for experiences. Should I utilize creative writing to avoid dry resume-like style or just include personal reflection? The same question goes for the personal statement. Mm -hmm. um, creative writing in, in 600, 700 characters is real tough. <laughs> Um, you know, we're really we're really working with maybe three to five sentences total to describe each activity. So it is it, I, I'm sure the AAMC has worked at the med schools to set it up. So it is intentionally short, but you do need to make the most of it. So um, I like to recommend what I say, including three things in each activity description. Um, the first two are, are kind of important. The second one's like if you can, or the third one's if you can fit it. So the first thing is the basics for, for each activity. The first thing in that description is what you did, okay? The second piece is that personal reflection. You know, this was so valuable to me because, or the biggest things I learned from this are these things, or this was so impactful to me because of this. So really reflecting on it and why it's important. Um, and then the third piece, if it makes sense and if it can be fit in there, is a connection to how that activity will help you as a future med student or a future physician. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to put that in or you, you run out of space a little bit, but if you can fit that connection piece, I like to say you are helping the reviewers of your application um, to, to do their job, which they want help with because there's so many of you to review. So if you say, this activity will help me in the future because of the communication skills that I learned from being a TA, you know, that's gonna, even if they didn't put those pieces together on, your, on their own, that's super helpful to them. Um, with the personal statement, of course, lots of reflection in what you're gonna write about in there as well. Um, you know, the, the content of what you're doing in that personal statement is important. But I feel like the real meat is the reflection on how what you're writing about impacted you and was so important to you. And I think applicants get lost in that sometimes. Um, they want to write about a story or they want to write about an activity. And oftentimes I'll say, that's wonderful to include that, but why is it important to you? Put that in there too. And you got to find that balance. So 
um, the personal reflection in both the activity descriptions and the personal statement, I think is really valuable. Thank you. We have about 12 minutes left, so I'm going to keep rolling with questions to see how many we can get through. Um, this question is actually directly for Darren. Did you ever have to retake MCAT or any courses to keep your application up to date? I decided to uh, retake my MCAT. Um, I did that about uh, three, three or so, three or four years from my first time taking the MCAT. And I actually took the MCAT, funny enough, uh, the last day before they switched to um, the modifications because of COVID. So in, in my particular case, um, my, my, my MCAT score was, you know, it, it, was, it, it wasn't the most, you know, it wasn't the 99th percentile, but it wasn't, you know, below um, where, I, where I would feel uncomfortable. And again, I, that's why I, I think it's so important to utilize resources like MSAR to really see where you line up in terms of the other applicants and, and the folks who matriculate. And then the other thing too is that there, when I decided to take the MCAT the second time, I, I switched things up. I, I decided to rely more on you know practice questions, the, the, the banks that, and also the full lengths that the AAMC provides. It's taking the MCAT. It's it's, it's like a marathon, right? It's a very very long uh, exam. It's grueling. Um, the more practice that you can get, the better. So I think that and asking people. Um, what they what they did and how long you know they took to prepare these are things that can provide some um, some insight into how it shapes uh, your own preparation. But I think that uh, practice with questions and really putting yourself through the hours um, will be very very beneficial. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manzera. Next question. In the mock interview webinar, they recommend asking for feedback if you're rejected post-interview. And I know you touched a little bit on your um, opportunities that you have for feedback, um, but in general, can you talk about, is it appropriate to ask for feedback if you are rejected pre-interview? I think ask, you know, the, the worst thing will happen is they'll say no, right? And you never know where they'll say, yes, you know, we, we screened you out because of X, Y, and Z, you know? So I, I think, uh, I would always err on the side of asking because the worst that will happen is, they, sorry, no, we don't offer feedback for pre-interview applicants, right? And but you might get at least a few hits where they say, yeah, here's what, why you were screened out, and I, I think it's valuable. Try it. I, I've had some that were screened out that have contacted us, and I was happy to meet with them. Thank you. Dr. Miskowski, do you remind repeating the big five again that pre-health advisors um, discussed for the 15 experiences? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, so a little context to the big five. Um, as I mentioned, the experiences section of the AMCAS application is, is so important um, and so valuable for the schools to review, to know what you've been engaging in and, and how have you been learning and developing. Um, there's probably 15 to 20 different experience types in that section. Okay. So, and each of them is a drop down list. You know, you, you hit the drop down and there they all are. But as a pre health advisor, um, and, and many med schools over the years have kind of helped us come to this list, there are at least five um, that we recommend you want to have represented pretty strongly in your application. And those are. Uh, first one is called community service slash volunteerism, health related. So that would be like hospital volunteering or clinic volunteering. Uh, the second one is community service and volunteerism, non-health related. So that's really volunteering anywhere else but healthcare settings. Okay. The third one is shadowing. That's a big one. Obviously, schools want to know that you've seen what physicians do. The fourth one um, is leadership experiences. We always say think about leadership very broadly. It, it doesn't mean you have to be like the president of a student organization at your school, but maybe you are, um, you know, a trainer at your place of employment, or maybe you lead the choir in your church or your place of worship. So leadership. And the fifth one um, is research experience. Um, we definitely know that not every MD school um, requires research experience, uh, but from our MD applicants, we do highly recommend it as a valuable experience that many of the schools are seeking. So those are the big five. Thank you. 
This next question is for Darren. In your personal statement, did you write about applying and not having a su successful application cycle? I, in my case, I only mentioned it in one sentence, um, but I, but I did talk about an overarching theme for. So I'll, I'll go ahead and be transparent in that. Um, at Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, I struggled academically. So that's something that I wanted to address. I knew that it was something that was going to be noted in my application. So I just decided to talk about uh, my, my post back experience, what specifically I did, uh, how I interacted, what, what did I change, right, to, to make these um, new results happen. So, I, so I, I talked about that experience, and then I also continued to elaborate on it in grad school, and then going on to further teaching the material to other students as well. So that's kind of how I decided to frame it. Um, and this is for all of the panelists. What is the biggest mistake you see in applications that leads to a rejection? I'm happy to start on this one. Um, I will say from a broad perspective, one of the biggest mistakes that I see is people applying who are not ready to apply. They feel fresh pressured by their peers. So let's say you're trying to be what we would call a traditional student, which I'm not sure how traditional that is anymore. But a traditional student comes directly out of undergrad and then starts med school, like basically the summer after they would graduate um, from undergrad. And so a lot of times when you're in like a pre-professional pre-health clubs or you're in pre-health um, advising groups, you feel a lot of pressure from those around you who are applying that you're not somehow meeting their timeline or the right timeline. And so you're pushing yourself to apply when you really don't have the robust activities you need. You may not have the, the right coursework or the right metrics you need. And so you're feeling that pressure to apply. So you turn in an application that maybe isn't the strongest you can put forward. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that I see is that you're applying when you're not ready to apply. You have this almost checkbox approach to doing activities and you have kind of what you might need on paper or maybe not as strong, but you go ahead and apply and it's not the strongest because you haven't put in the time um, to get the experiences you need to know who you are as a future healthcare professional. So that's one mistake that I see and then I'll let other panelists chime in. Yeah, I'll 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 add to that cuz that that's true. So when when you're not ready to apply often means that maybe you haven't spent as much time on your application and it's sloppy. So, you know, uh you heard about, you know, not using a correct word at the beginning of your personal statement. Um so I used to have so this is a story I tell. I used to have a a surgeon on our committee, uh, selection committee and Basically, they, they literally counted spelling mistakes, grammatical errors, you know, things like that, and said sloppy in the application, sloppy in the OR, patients die. Because really, as a physician, it's about attention to detail, right? And, uh, you know, and, and not to scare anybody, you know, about that. But, I mean, you're, you're putting your, your life's work to date in front of someone to judge, right? You want to make sure you dot your I's, cross your T's, you have it ready, and 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 have a group of people to view it. I always say I know what I want to write, and and so when I read my own writing, I, I, yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. But even at my level, I know I need to get someone sometimes to read it because does this make sense to you? Is that idea you know articulated well? Because sometimes it isn't. So, and I, I I think you I think Dr. Green hit on the big one I see too. Um, an, an application that's not ready, or as as pre health advisors we would sometimes say, is it not competitive. And I will say that I've, I've worked with students on, on both sides of this and that um, sometimes they they know that they are not competitive, that their application is not ready, but they're going to apply anyway, just to see how it, you know, if it works out, you know, maybe they've got some timeline pressures to them. Um, on the other side of the not competitive, I see the applicants that that never checked with anyone, didn't have anyone look things over. Um, they don't know what they don't know, so they submitted the application thinking everything was there, but like my applicant, I told you with the 520 and the 4.0 that didn't have any interviews in December, she didn't know, she didn't check, so she kind of unintentionally applied with her application not being the strongest, so sometimes, again, they they know it's not the strongest, they're going to just try it anyway, and sometimes they they think it is strong and, and maybe know that, don't know that it's not. <laughs> I also agree with the other applicants and actually everything that they said, I would probably prioritize at the top. And then if I, if I could just add maybe one more thing that's not as that wouldn't reach to the surface at the top, but it is also the interview. If you're fortunate to get an interview, 
it's really, really important to practice and to, but not to come across as um, over rehearsed and, you know, not genuine, of course, but it's something that you want to take very, very seriously. You know, me medicine is a very professional uh, career. So it's, it's important to be able to uh, really think about what you want to say and also articulate your story in a, in a, in a way that also aligns with the school's mission. So the interviews are something to really keep in mind as well. Wonderful. And lastly, we're going to do this rapid fire. Uh, final gem or words of encouragement for reapplicants. Uh, mine would be keep attending things like this. Look at medical associations, look at uh, pre-health groups. Um, keep attending things like this where you get to interact with current medical students and health um, uh, health education professionals, admissions folks, advisors, the more you hear this, the more this is going to help you with your application. It's like learning another language. And so you're going to be speaking the right language by the time you get to that interview. So keep going to things like this. That's my final gem. Rest of the panelists, final gem. Stay positive and have a growth mindset. Um, agree with Dr. Green and Dr. Manzera, along with, you know, you know, educate yourself about this process. And don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, for a lot of you, this is your first time doing this. Um, for some of us, we do this for a living. And if we work at your institution, we're free. <laughs> so ask us for help. We've seen uh, hundreds or, or thousands of these over the years if, if we're a veteran doing this. So please reach out. I completely agree. And there's also a lot of different resources, podcasts, books that you can read about emotional intelligence, intelligence leadership, avoiding imposter syndrome, you know, how you can maintain wellness, um, how you can sort of adopt a re resiliency and a growth mindset. So a lot of, I did a lot of reading <laughs> during my gap years. So uh, it's something that I always like to try to remind other people to do. Thank you. Great note for us to close on. So thank you again to all of our panelists for sharing their expertise today. And thank you everyone for joining. We know we didn't get to all of your questions. There were a lot of them. Um, I know there's going to be some resources shared, including this recording. Um, it'll be available approximately 24 hours from now um, in the auditorium. So also don't forget to join us tomorrow to chat with 92 medical schools, association and associations and students groups to get more of your application questions answered. Um, take care, everyone, and best wishes.